If you've been following the launch of Intel's new Alder Lake CPUs, their new 12th gen chips, you'll likely have heard about DDR5 and just how painfully expensive it is. In this video, I want to cover what's actually new with DDR5, including the new XMP 3.0 spec, which is actually a massive change from XMP 2.0 that we're all used to, and what makes these things just so insanely expensive. Taking a look at a DDR5 module, you can see just how different this is from DDR... Oh, uh, oh, <laughs> uh, my bad. Uh, this is a DDR4 module. Uh, oh right, yes, those are the DDR5 ones and this is DDR4. Yeah, my bad. Uh, puns aside, you would be forgiven for mistaking a DDR4 module for DDR5, or vice versa. I mean, they have the exact same number of pins on the connector at 288, although they aren't exactly physically identical. Despite also sharing a very similar curved edge connector, the notch that's in the middle that is just slightly off center, which stops you from installing the memory the sort of wrong way round, well, that has been moved. Only by a, a couple of millimeters, but it's enough that you can't install a DDR4 module in a DDR5 board and vice versa. Okay, so they changed the slot so we can't use the old stuff in new boards, but why? What's actually new? Well, remarkably, quite a lot. The biggest physical change is how the modules get their power. With DDR4, the motherboard supplies the modules with the exact amount of power they need, which uh, for DDR4 is generally 1.2 volts standard, although sometimes can be more like, say, 1.3, 1.35 volts for the higher speed overclocked kits. That's pretty much the way that it's always been, and to be honest, it makes sense, right? Have one well-built and highly efficient regulator to convert the power from your power supply into the, the right level for the memory all at once, keep it in one place, and, like I said, highly efficient. The problem, though, is noise. The more copper you have between where the power is outputted and where it's received, the more interference and noise can get at it. But Andrew, it's, it's DC power. That's a, a flat line. How can DC be noisy? Well, take a look. Here is what the five volt rail from your USB port actually looks like. That is hardly a flat line. In fact, it's varying by as much as 100 millivolts, which, while well, that doesn't sound like much, when you're dealing with sensitive data in volatile memory and you're trying to achieve 5 billion transfers per second, well, noise like that would make it functionally impossible. Now, to make it clear, that isn't what your motherboard's memory power circuit would produce, but the principle is the same. The longer the line, the more all of the other lines nearby can induce noise, the more radio frequencies can interfere, and just in general, the noisier it's going to get. So the solution? Move the regulators onto the modules. Every DDR5 module will have one of these little voltage regulators called a PMIC or Power Management Integrated Circuit. That means that the modules are supplied with a regular power supply rail, specifically 12 volts for the module itself and 3.3 volts for the PMIC controller. And they now have much shorter lines with much less uh, you know, interference and other lines crossing over and really anywhere nearby. This allows for more stable power to the ch memory chips themselves, allowing them to run faster while still maintaining a, a good level of stability. There are downsides to moving the regulator onto the module, specifically a reduction in efficiency, as there are now four or up to four regulators on a standard motherboard, one on each module, that are all kind of doing their own thing, rather than one well-built one, which means that the modules will have increased heat output and, of course, costs, 
as you now have, well, more components and more complicated PCB designs to accommodate both the new controllers and all of the other changes. One thing I want to note quickly is something that Intel mentioned in their Blueprint presentation, which is that the, these controllers, there's actually two different kinds of the PMIC controller, an overclockable one and a, a locked sort of non-overclockable one. The latter are set to 1.1 volts by default, although they should still allow you to set them to say up to around, I think 1.4 volts, uh, likely through something like XMP or JDEC profiles. But the overclockable one, uh, you know, type, that's something that you'll have to purchase specifically. It's physically different hardware. And as far as I'm aware, I haven't seen anyone advertising that feature, so I would assume that most, if not all, of the memory modules that are available and on sale right now are the, the, the locked kind instead. It does seem like that sort of thing is the sort of feature that only so that the pro overclockers will use, but it's worth mentioning. Something else that's pretty drastically changed is how the data is sent to your CPU. Modern CPUs are 64-bit, meaning they use up to 64-bit memory addresses, instructions, and data, like integers, for example. Rather, obviously then, your RAM has to be able to send those 64 bits to your CPU. And with just how insanely fast your CPU runs, it's generally best to send all of those 64 bits at the same time. So DDR4 does just that. It has one 64-bit wide connection to the CPU. Perfect, right? Except not quite. Not every piece of data or instruction is actually 64 bits wide. I mean, in C Sharp, unless you specify that a number is a long rather than a regular int, the int is only 32 bits wide. So when the RAM tries to go and send that 32-bit integer, it has to fill up those other 32 bits with wasted data. And that takes time, which means that not only does your latency increase, but there's even a chance that your CPU will have to sit idle waiting for the RAM to fill that wasted data and then transfer it. So what does DDR5 do? Well, it splits that bus in two. DDR5 has two 32-bit connections to your CPU, which can operate either independently or together. That means if a 32-bit int comes along, it can be fired through one bus without having to wait for the other one to fill up with useless data. But if a 64-bit long drops by, well, then it can send half over the first bus and the other half on the second. On top of that, the burst buffer size, basically the queue of ready to go data, is now double that of DDR4 at 16 instead of 8, and technically speaking that is 16 per 32-bit bus, but you can't just add those together. This doesn't count as dual channel, and you'll still want to run multiple sticks of memory to get the best performance. One of the most talked about features of the DDR5 ICs, or memory chips themselves, is the introduction of on-die ECC. I should make it clear, that is not the same as sort of proper ECC or error correcting code, and it doesn't mean that every DDR5 module is now an ECC module. This doesn't do any transmission error checking or correction, hence the name on die. But what it does is instead of storing the data just on its own, it stores the data and eight parity bits. A parity bit is essentially like the, the result of an equation that you can use to know if something has gone wrong and sometimes even correct it. A single parity bit is often just storing the whether the number of ones and zeros in your, your binary number uh, adds up to odd or even. So if any one bit flips by accident, you'll know that that piece of data has been corrupted. The eight parity bits here actually allow for a, a correction as well on a, a single bit flip. To give you an example, and at a basic level, if you were to store an integer like, say, 
420, that would be written as this in binary, uh, but let's say by accident the second zero from the front gets flipped into a 1. Well that number now reads 1444 which is significantly different to our original number, but thanks to those parity bits, the RAM can work out that that bit has flipped and correct it before it has a chance to break anything. It's completely transparent to you, the user, and happens automatically, and is actually a really welcomed addition. Now, that's kind of what's new on the inside, but much like every new version of DDR, the timings and frequencies are changing too. As is the trend with these new versions, the frequencies are going up, but sadly, so are the timings. Intel's maximum supported DDR5 spec on their Alder Lake chips is 4800 mega transfers per second, up from 3200 on DDR4. That is a healthy improvement for sure, but the catch is the cast latency, or how many RAM cycles it takes to return data. That's going from, generally speaking, between sort of CL12 and CL18, to more like CL34 to CL40. Uh, basically, that means that instead of taking around 12 cycles to return data, it will now take 34. That means for certain workloads, it's quite likely that DDR4 will actually be faster than DDR5, at least for now until you know, we can reduce the timings and, and increase the frequencies. Now, speaking of timings and frequencies, let's talk about XMP 3.0. XMP, or Extreme Memory Profile, is a feature that Intel developed back in 2007, which basically uh, has pr uh, profiles that are built into the module itself that the manufacturer has tested and validated to be stable on that kit. That means that all you have to do is enable one of those profiles and all of those timings, voltages and frequencies get automatically applied without you having to go and manually set every single one. XMP 2.0 comes with two profiles on board that are hard coded, meaning that you can't rename or save over them with your own custom settings. XMP 3.0 though, well that comes with three locked profiles from the memory manufacturer and two rewritable profiles that you can save your own settings to. Plus you can now attach custom names to each profile, making it easy to know which is which. For example, a manufacturer could include a, a base profile, a frequency optimized profile and a timings optimized profile, or even one that is optimized specifically for say AMD Ryzen then you can save your own settings with their own names too. So why is DDR5 so damn expensive? Well, the new voltage regulators that are on every module definitely adds cost, and the new larger XMP chip for storing those extra profiles, including overwritable ones and new names, well, that's gonna add cost too, at least for the modules that actually support XMP. And more importantly, both of those things are likely to be an added cost for the long term. In the short term, of course, there's the early adopter tax, which is basically purchasing these before they're being manufactured at a large enough scale that costs can come down. But what isn't helping on top of all of that is the insane global chip shortage and the absolute madness in the shipping world because it means that the, the chip manufacturers are running completely at capacity and will be for the foreseeable future, which means that they just don't have enough production capacity to manufacture high volumes of the RAM. And even if they can manufacture it, they might not even be able to ship it to, to your area because of the, the absolute insanity in the, the shipping industry. Neither of those things are helping, plus all of those longer term factors mean that for the foreseeable future, I can't see DDR5 coming down in price, at least by all that much. And I certainly don't expect it to ever really get price parity 
or at least for a very long time with DDR4, again because of those longer term added costs, specifically those voltage regulators. So that's a look at what's new with DDR5, the new XMP 3.0 spec, and a bit about why these are so insanely expensive, and I suppose a bit about the future of their cost as well. Uh, if you have any questions or your own thoughts, I would love to hear them in the comments down below. Uh, what do you think of DDR5? Is it something that you can see yourself, you know, upgrading to with the new Order Lake CPUs? Or would you rather stick with DDR4 since you can with these chips? Or are you just not upgrading right now at all? Feel free to let me know in the comments down below. If you want to check out some DDR5, I can't guarantee you can buy any right now, but I will leave an affiliate link in the description you can check out. That's a, an Amazon affiliate link that will take you to a local Amazon store where you can potentially see pricing when you watch this, assuming there's any stock literally worldwide. Uh, otherwise, that is, uh, that's kind of it for me. If you want to see more videos like this one on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday basis, you can hit the subscribe button and turn on the bell notification icon. You can also support the channel a load of different ways. You can do so directly with the YouTube join button where you get access to our Money in Discord chat, sponsor free videos, and some cool emojis to use in the comments and on our weekly live streams. Or you can support on Patreon instead if you prefer. There's also merch hoodies or t-shirt like this one or a load of other designs that I made myself. Or there's just affiliate links galore down in the description. Places like Overclock UK if you're buying from there. And just a load of stuff so feel free to check it out. I'll leave some more videos on the end cards. Probably the older Lake reviews if you're interested in checking those out. Otherwise, yeah. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you on the next video.